Good morning. The hymn writer said, Oh, worship the King, the one who is all glorious enthroned. And let everyone sing to the praise of his name. So let's stand together and do just that. everybody you guys can go ahead and be seated uh thank you so much for being here today we're so glad we could share this time of worship with you we're especially glad if uh, you are visiting with us for the very first time um if you're a first time guest or you're a returning a returning visitor you've never done this before we would really encourage you to text the word guest to the number 94090 you can do that from your phone right now um this just gives you an opportunity to fill out a little uh, information card that'll be sent right back to you um and then it gives us the opportunity to reach back out to you to say hello and thank you for being here. Um, that's all we want to do this morning. Eventually, um, we would love for the opportunity for you to join us, to be on mission with us, but right now, we just want to say hello. Um, and speaking on mission, speaking about being on mission, um, one of the things that we preach here every week is that it is important to be on mission where your feet are. And uh, we wanted to show you what this looks like um, this morning with this little video. 
I'm originally from Mexico. I have family in El Salvador, but my family and I moved to New Mexico in 2012. And in 2016, I came over to Texas Tech. When my mom was growing up in El Salvador, um, there was a missionary from First Lubbock. Uh, her last name was Bailey. And she was one of my mom's like English teachers or somehow came in contact with my mom. When I first started coming to First Lubbock, my mom told me about it and I was like, that's super cool because now I go to First Lubbock. So like 40 years after, the seed that was planted in another country has made like full circle. That just keeps popping into my mind of like, you never know the effect of what you're doing um, on, in the people around you is gonna have in the future. The fact that this missionary that impacted my mom's family in such a way now has indirectly affected my life too, I guess. It's like a motivation to be aware of the opportunities and the people around you because you never know what type of fruit it's gonna come out of the seed that you plant. And now that I'm here learning, you don't have to go anywhere to be on mission. You don't have to do all these things to be on mission. You're on mission right here and right now. So like school and my job is like secondary, I guess, when you realize that God's plans for you are so much bigger and that there's people around you and that your focus should be on the people around you. I'm here in Lubbock. Yes, I came to Lubbock to get an education and to go to, go to school, um, to develop my professional career. Those are good things, but just realizing that I'm here uh, because this is where God wanted me to be and to be mindful of the people around me is um, so, much, so much better and like so much enriching than just being here to go to school. Um, again, your mission field is, is where your feet are. You don't have to go across the globe. You don't have to go out of the country. Um, those are good things to do, and uh, you never know what kind of seeds you plant whenever you'll go on those, those international missions, but you have an opportunity to be on mission um, right where your feet are every single day, um, and that's just the heartbeat of this church. Um, so we're, we're so thankful for Claudia for that story. Um, uh, and uh, as you guys walked in this morning, you probably picked up a bulletin. There's a couple announcements in there, a couple of opportunities for you to get on mission with us. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to highlight is that tonight at 6 o'clock, um, we're having communion in Lowry Hall. Um, that's right below us. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to come together as a family um, to, uh, to share in the Lord's Supper. This is always a really cool opportunity. In fact, it's so cool um, that my own parents drove in from Dallas this weekend to come have communion with us. Um, so if you're not there, you don't have an excuse. Uh, not really. I'm kidding. Um, but uh, this is again. This is like this is such a cool opportunity that we have to come together as a family um, and share in Lord's Supper. So we hope that you'll be there tonight, six o'clock in Lowry Hall. Um, and then another thing I want to remind you is that uh, we share the live stream of our service every single week on Facebook. You can head over there right now. You can share uh, the live stream um, using the hashtag Scandalous Influence. Um, Bobby is continuing his uh, sermon series on counter-religion discipleship. Um, so we're really encouraged to be uh, challenged by that and encouraged by that this morning. And while you guys are sharing that uh, live stream, you can stand up and greet the people around you. Despair. There you were, 
in the shadows Holding out your hand You may be there And now where would I be Without you Where would I be Jesus You are the voice in the desert Calling me out in the dead of night Fighting my battles for me You were my rescue story Lifted me up from the ashes You carried my soul from death to life Bringing me from glory to glory You were my rescue story Yeah. 
Jesus, you change everything. Life, healed, hope, found, here, now. Jesus, you change everything. Change. guys as you're being seated and taking your Bibles or smart device we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew chapter 18 picking up where we left off last week and the disciples had come to Jesus and asked him uh, who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God they let their own ego get in the way tried to hide it in kingdom language but it's really their ego that uh, brought forth that question and to answer the question Jesus plopped down in front of them a child that uh, a child with no status, a person with uh, no advantage, uh, this is your definition of what greatness looks like in the kingdom of God. And so we continue in that vein this morning of understanding that. He's really saying to those disciples, listen, you've got a big ego uh, thinking in grandiose terms. I really need you to think small. I need you to think small about little things that add up to great things in the kingdom of God. And so he's continuing with that in our verses this uh, morning and really talking about us being stewards of our of our influence, that we have these little opportunities with little people, little things every day uh, that give us the opportunity to make a big difference in the kingdom of God. Charles Plum was a Navy aviator, graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy, was trained at Fighters Weapons School. He was a Top Gun pilot for the U.S. Navy. Through, he flew 74 successful missions over North Vietnam until his 75th mission when he was shot down and for the next nearly six years was a POW, shot down on his 75th mission five days before his tour was due to end. And so for the next six years, nearly six years, he spent in a POW camp in, in North Vietnam. After that, he went on the lecture circuit talking about the life lessons he learned while in captivity. If you jump ahead a few years after his release, uh, Captain Plum was sitting in a restaurant one evening having a meal with his wife when he noticed that there was a, a gentleman across the restaurant that kept looking at him. Every time he would make cont eye contact, the guy would look away. Finally, after this occurred several times, the man came up across the restaurant and said, excuse me, he said, I hate to interrupt your meal, but aren't you Captain Plum? Plum's eyes opened wide. The man said, didn't you fly F-4s off the Kitty Hawk? And weren't you shot down over north, north, uh, in North Vietnam, over Hanoi? And Plum said, yes, how did you know that? And the man said, I packed your parachute. Plum jumped up, as any one of us would, with great shock and surprise, embraced the man and began to shake his hand vigorously, thanking him. And the man was really taken back, didn't know what to say. And he said, so I, I guessed it worked. 
And he said, well, yeah, of course it worked. He said, that's why I'm here. You're the reason I'm alive today. And the man said, well, I've got a question that he said, he, he asked, did, did all 18 panels open on the chute? The canopy on that chute, when you eject, has 18 different panels. And he wanted to know, did I do my job well? Did all 18 panels hold? And Plum said, no. He said, uh, three of them were faulty, but he said, that's on me, not you. He said, I ejected at nearly 600 knots at low altitude. And he said, that's why those three panels failed. And Plum asked the man, do you realize how many people you saved? And the man said, no, I've never really kept up with that sort of thing. He said, your story is unique because it's so well known. And, but he said, I don't keep up with it. He said, my, my deepest satisfaction comes from knowing I served in some small way. Plum said he couldn't sleep that night. It was a restless night. He said, all I could think about was this man who packed my chute. He said, I envisioned him down in the bowels of the USS Kitty Hawk, standing hour upon hour at those long tables, handling those cords, those silks, each individual panel, folding them carefully, holding the fate of unknown numbers in his hand. And he said, the man just wanted to serve. That was his only satisfaction, was being in service to others. I think that's much akin to the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples then and us today. That if we're really concerned about doing kingdom work, we need to notice the little things around us. That God entrusts to your path and my path on a daily basis these little things. It goes all the way back to the previous account where we started uh, even before last week. It talks about faith in terms of a, of a mustard seed. He talks about faith being found in, in, in things like prayer. Faith in kingdom life is evident in things like a, a small child who has no status whatsoever. And he's saying, as you change your focus, as you check your ego, and you, and you realize that God has entrusted your, to your path on a daily basis, these little things, little people, little opportunities, little tasks, it's in these things and in these people that you make the greatest impact. It's about influence. We are stewards of influence. And much of what we need to understand about the influence that you have, the influence that I have, is found in these words of, of Jesus in verses 6 through 9. And the first thing I would call our attention to is that the influence that you have and I have, that this kind of influence in the world around us that God entrusts to us on a daily basis where our feet are, this kind of, this kind of influence that we will, this clout that, that we have as people, it is, it, is, it, is a cause, it is a causational type of influence. It is, it is an influence that has a causational effect. That is, the influence that I have and you have, it causes something to happen in the lives of other people, for good or bad. Notice how Jesus describes it here in, in verse 6 and 7. He said, but whoever causes one of these little ones... Whoever causes one, and that's going to be a redundant word throughout this narrative. It gives us our, our focal point on the one. That, that you and I as disciples and in the world in which we live, where our feet are, uh, we're, we're, we're more worried about quality than we are quantity. That's where the impact is made in one. And so, but whoever causes one of these little ones, literally least of these, micron, microi in, in the Greek. Whoever causes one of these, these little ones, these, these that have been deemed less, these that, that literally are one of the least, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, scandalizo, 
stumble, scandalizo, scan, it is scandalous when we call someone to fall, the least of these among us. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. The world is going to throw stumbling blocks at us, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. The least of these are those that that believe. What is, what is so scandalous about this, the word, the word stumble that, that is used here, it's a word that, that means to cause someone to lose their faith, to cause someone to miss out on, on salvation. And Jesus says, the, these little ones, they, they believe in me. And because they, they believe in me, they, they want to understand me. They want to learn about me. They want to understand me. They want to understand fully the life of faith, what it looks like, how it's to be lived. And Jesus' point is, is that you and I, we're responsible. We have a very influential role in shaping in the least of these. These that are, so, that are so impressionable, you and I have a role in shaping their understanding of the kingdom of God and how the life of faith is to be lived. Listen, don't underestimate the importance of their desire to understand. I mean, we've already seen Jesus ask his disciples twice in his direct teaching to them, do you understand? And even though they affirmed it, said, oh yes, we, we understand. We see that by their, by their actions later on, they really didn't understand, did they? In fact, Jesus would show exasperation at one point in teaching his disciples and say, how long am I with you? And you still don't understand. Think about the power of this. This is, this is the master teacher himself, Jesus, teaching his disciples. His disciples have a direct audience with him. And yet they are still struggling to understand. So that tells me we need to be all the more on the guard. If Jesus, the master teacher, had this much difficulty teaching his, his disciples himself and their struggle to understand, what does that say to you and I about the influence that we have in those around us that are seeking to understand something about the kingdom of God? Paul would even address this, this issue, this issue in 1 Corinthians In chapter 8, in verse 13, he says, Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, if it has a scandalous effect in his life, causes him to miss out on faith, or something is diminished in his life and his understanding of faith, I'll never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. I don't want my brother to fall out. My my impressionable, vulnerable brother, listen, I don't want to wield my, uh, my liberties and my freedoms in a way that have a negative impact upon him. This is a trust that we hold this, this influence. And listen, we all have influence. I mean, we think influence is something for those in powerful positions. The reality is, is every, there's not a person in this room that doesn't have influence, that doesn't wield clout in the life of someone else. We are agents of influence, each and every one of us. Do you know, listen, every one of us have the power to make others happy. We do. It's a power you possess. It's a power I possess. Now, now, now granted, there's some people that, that you know, we all have this power to make others happy. Some can make others happy by just walking into the room. Others can make people happy by walking out of the room. <laughs> but, but it's still influence. And so we can take this kind of negative spin that we're seeing here in this passage and we, can, and, and we can try to spin it in a positive way, using our influence in a way that is positive, in a way that, that is uplifting, in a way that is formative in people's understanding of the kingdom of God and the life of faith, how it's to be lived and how it's to be practiced. Parents here this morning, you are the the number one key influence in the life of your children when it comes to understanding faith. How faith is supposed to be lived. What faith is supposed to look like. It's not me. 
I get, I get one, I get one 20 minute shot, 20 minutes if you're lucky, you know, it's probably going to be 30 minutes. I get one shot during the week. I was just asked before the service why, why, why I talk so long when I get up here. I said, it's because I only get one shot. But I'm not a major influencer in the life of your child, nor is their Sunday school teacher, nor is their preschool minister, their children's minister, and all of that, their youth minister. You, mom, dad, you're, you're the major influence in the life of your child when it comes to understanding the life of faith. Do they hear you? Do they hear you embracing that role? Do they see you embracing that role? Do they hear you talking about faith in ways that are positive, in ways that are formative? Do they see how you arrange your schedule and how you, how you dictate the schedule of that child so that we can be in the house of God gathering with other believer, believers in a way that is rhythmic, in a way that is consistent, where they're not picking up the vibe that church is something we do just when there's no other option left on the calendar? What about in here? We're all agents of influence in this room right now. What if others sitting around you, they see your indifference, your body language of indifference, your, your attitude of, of indifference? Maybe someone here this, this morning that is searching for meaning in life. You don't know the circumstances that have brought them here this morning, but they're searching for something in life. They are grasping for something. For some, this, this, may, be their, this may be their last grasp of hope. And they see you on your phone playing. And they see you texting or you're texting friends in, in the youth group. You're up here jacking around with your phone in, in your hand. Listen, and listen, if you're indifferent to the things of God, that's your business. But woe unto you if you're the distraction to someone around you that God is seeking to speak to. Woe unto you. If you are the one interrupting the person of the Holy Spirit who is seeking to speak to the heart of another person around you. What about out in the community? How guarded are you in things you say about your church, the leadership of your church? Do you use, do you use disparaging, belittling comments about the leadership of your church to the point that those that are weak and vulnerable, they can no longer come to church or listen to preaching or teaching because of the things that you have said? How are you using your influence? When someone is living a life that is in direct contradiction, that has chosen a lifestyle that is in direct contradiction to the historical teaching of God's Word. Do you speak truth or do you withhold truth? There's, and oftentimes we uh, see individuals who withhold truth and want to manipulate truth in a way that is accommodating to the culture, all in the name of being more loving. Listen, there is nothing more hateful than withholding truth and not speaking historically understood teachings and beliefs from the Word of God for the sake of reader response and cultural accommodation. We want to use our influence in ways that are positive, in ways that are formative. We want to use our influence today in the circumstances and the little opportunities that God presents to us right now in these moments so I don't have to live with remorse tomorrow. Because I recognize that my influence is causational. It can cause something to happen in the life of another person. There's something else about this influence that, that we will that is ours. And just kind of going in a different direction because the tone is somewhat negative in the text and the warnings that Jesus is giving. This influence that he's describing, it's correctable. Now, he's talking about being a stumbling block, so having a scandalous effect upon the life of someone so that their faith is diminished or lost altogether. But this is something that is correctable. And the language is stark and it is harsh and it is intense, but it is correctable. He shows the, ta the means by which this task is accomplished. He says there in, in verse 8 and 9, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. 
If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. So now what is a, what has been a negative influence causing a stumbling block, now then Jesus gives the remedy. He says, here's how we solve this problem. Pretty strong language to either kill or be killed. In the same measures that Jesus took back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30, and those verses where he spelled out the means by, by which you protect, protect individuals from sexual abuse, he now applies that same measure to the protection of the least of these among us. Kill or be killed. See, that, that's the nature of our, that's how, that's how strongly Jesus feels. That's how adamant Jesus is about us using well and not abusing our influence. In writing to the church at, at Rome, Paul would say in, in Romans chapter 14 and verse 13, therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. And listen, even though Jesus is usually using hyperbole here, just as it was hyperbole back in Matthew chapter 5, he's using the language of exaggeration to make his point, it is nonetheless serious. And he uses hyperbole in an intentional way so that we will pause and give evaluation to our lives, understanding our influence, understanding the influence that I have. What is it that I need to cut off? What is it that I need to, what is it that I need to put away? What is it that I need to no longer practice? What, what right is it that I need to throw away? What privilege, what freedom is it that I have that I need to put away so that it won't negative, negatively impact others in their understanding of the life of faith? Maybe it's a question of who is it that you need to put away? What group of people, maybe is it, with, with whom you no longer should associate because of the negative impact that group has on another, especially the least of these. See, Moses understood the, the power of, of influence and how, and how influence is contagious. The seminal impact that, that individuals can have that have the wrong kind of influence, how that can impact the group. And giving a charge to his officers in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 8, it says, Then the officers, in Moses' instruction, it says, Then the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Who is the man that is afraid and faint-hearted? Let him depart and return to his house, so that he might not make his brother's hearts melt like his heart. Listen, I don't need negative influence. I don't need negative voices up on the front line of battle. If you, if you identify negative influences, get rid of them. Send them back to the house. We don't need them here. And so that's the question that Jesus poses. That's the remedy. What is it I need to cut off? What is it I need to get rid of? What liberty do I need to throw away that I think is my right, what I'm privileged and entitled to? Who is it with whom I no longer need to associate in the hopes that it might actually enhance the life of someone else in their understanding of the life of faith? Because here's the, here's the consequence. And Jesus makes it very clear that our influence, it is consequential. The influence that you and I wield for good or bad, it is, it is with consequence to us. The language is harsh, and it's found throughout verses 6 through, through 9. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is, it, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the man through whom the stumbling block comes." If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter that inner life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the, into the eternal fire. If your eyes 
If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. Strong language. Now remember the audience to whom Jesus speaks. It's not some pagan nation out there. He's, he's speaking to disciples. Speaking to his, to his own disciples about a fiery hell, the consequence of becoming a stumbling block to others. And this is nothing new. The prophets of old spoke to the people of God, Israel, about how they're supposed to, ha- how they're supposed to behave. Your God's called out people. The burden of godly living is upon you, not pagan nations. That's like Paul saying in the letter to the Corinthians. Paul said, what, what do I have to do with judging the world? The world's behaving the way the world behaves. They're going to do what they're going to do. You're the ones I'm worried about because you're the ones that carry the burden of Christian representation, bearing the burden of the life of faith, living it out for the world to see it. Because you're playing an influential role in shaping their understanding of what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's why Peter would write, let judgment begin in the household of God. That burden is upon upon us. And I know when we see these passages having to do with the doctrine of hell or, you know, judgments of, of condemnation, you know, what you hear out there in the world today is, well, you know, I've been trying to understand. I just don't see how a, how a loving God could, could uh, you know, talk about hell, how a loving God could conceive of a place like, like hell and these kind of judgments of, of con- condemnation. But don't, don't forget who's talking about this. It's the most loving person in the world. It's the most loving person this world has ever known that has ever walked the face of this earth that talks about a fiery condemnation for those that don't use their influence well. So I think we have to do, I think if we're going to really walk out of here in taking this passage in a way that is meaningful and applicable and not just fearful, something that shuts us down in fear, I think we need to see the bigger picture of just understanding our influence. Quit thinking in terms of grandiose ideas, looking out to the horizon, oh, I don't want to miss it, what God's doing out there. You know, see what, in other words, just let's see what God's doing at your feet. That's all Jesus is saying. Your opportunities are at your feet in the seeming in the seemingly little things. If every believer, professing believer and follower of Christ committed themselves to doing the things that are at their feet, imagine the impact on this world. So envision it it in a positive way of how I can use my influence in the littlest of things to make the biggest difference. Frances Burnett, I think it was in 1886, somewhere on there, she wrote uh, Little Lord Fauntleroy, a little children's novel about little seven-year-old boy Cedric goes to England to be, uh, to live with his, live with his grandfather. And uh, it's really, it's really a powerful story about, about, about your, how innocence and how, how seeing the best in people of how influential that can be in shaping the lives of other people, because that represents Cedric. His grandfather is a, is a very mean, callous, cantankerous man, selfish man, very harsh. But all Cedric can see is the good in his grandfather. And he's constantly affirming that good, despite, what, despite the evils of his grandfather, the cantankerousness, the bitterness of his grandfather, all Cedric can see is the good. And he just says constantly over and over and over to his grandfather, Grandfather, people must just love you. For all the goodness and the kindness that you perform, I just know people love you. And despite the grandfather's behavior, how mean he was and how selfish he was, this is all Cedric could see. Of course, you know the story. What happens, it's had such an effect upon his grandfather that he did not want to violate this trust, 
This trust of good that his grandson had for him. And eventually what happened with the passage of time is that this grandfather started becoming the kind of man that his grandson thought him to be. It's influence. Seeing the good in people, the possibilities in people, not seeing what they are right now, which isn't always favorable, but seeing the possibilities of what might be. We've all probably had experiences like this. I had one at my first pastorate. There was a lady, elderly lady, Ms. Ida. And man, she was the most, uh, I mean, just a sour look on her face all the time. And, you know, I'd stand at the back door of that first pastorate, you know, and I was greeting folks as they're coming out on, on Sunday morning. And man, there's Ms. Ida. I'd see her coming five. I mean, the bitterness on her face. I mean, I could see it back there 10 people deep. And I thought, oh man, here she comes. And uh, I'd get up there, Ms. Ida, how you doing? And then she'd proceed to tell you. Oh, and it was just, oh, just down in the mouth about everything, you know. I mean, just life, weather, it didn't matter. She could find a negative spin on it. Well, after about my first five or six months of this, you know, I'm just, I'm getting dragged down. And uh, I had an idea when I was standing back there. I thought, well, here she comes, about 10 people back. And when she gets there, before she could ever get my hand to say anything, I said, well, look at you, Miss Ida. I said, I think you got a little spring in your step today, girl. And she said, well, you know, I do feel pretty good today. And it was like that from then on. You know, and maybe, maybe that's, that's the attitude we need to properly understand the influence that we have in the lives of others. It's an influence we use in a formative way, a positive way to affect change. And maybe when we wield our influence in, a, in this kind of vein, in this kind of, of spirit, our influence may help rescue someone from themselves. And in so doing, we may find ourselves rescued from this kind of scandalous fate. When you leave here today, be aware of your influence and use it well. Father, thank you for this reminder of the influence that each one of us hold that has been entrusted to us. And Father, as those who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ, Father, we want to understand, as you understood, the importance of others seeing portrayed well the life of faith, how it is to be lived and how it is to be modeled. And Father, we know that that can't be accomplished apart from an intimate walking relationship with you. And so Father, I pray for this time of invitation that if there's someone that has never committed their life to you, that Lord, this day might be that discovery that you have placed at their feet the opportunity to walk through the door, to answer the door and say, yes, Lord, Enter into my life because I want to now follow you. For others, Lord, that want to be a part of a church family that desires to be on mission in our community and around the world, wherever we might find ourselves. Father, we know that we're not called to walk alone, not in isolation, but to gather together with your people. And it's as your people gathered together and then dispersed that we become a formidable army in our community. And so, Father, we give this time to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.